So the next speaker is Jason Goodman. I don't know if you imagine, but Jason has been in 3D, stereoscopic 3D, for a quarter of a century. Plastic surgery is amazing, right? That's right. You must have. You fell into 3D when you were, were a kid. I did. The, the the first the first stereoscopic motion picture that I ever shot was in 1991 on black and white reversal film. And I don't want anyone to leave this conference thinking that they're waiting for something to happen. The technology is here now. And I, I will also... I will also slightly disagree that you know that a particular technology like an auto stereoscopic panel or something like that is going to cause this all to explode. As Jim said, we've got thousands of movie theater screens in excess of 40,000 movie theater screens around the world. We've got millions of televisions and most of those televisions are smart televisions that have a YouTube button. So you could, you could leave here this afternoon and make 3D content that could be monetized. I don't want anybody to wait around to make any 3D content. So uh, my name is Jason Goodman. I am the founder and CEO of 21st Century 3D. Many people may have become familiar with my company and my work when we developed a uh, integral camera made out of a Panasonic DVX. That was on the cover of Bernard Mendeburu's book. But today I want to talk to you about the current state of content creation in 2013. Now obviously Avatar is the the film that brought 3D to everyone's attention. But we're living in a post-Avatar world right now, and where are we with 3D four years after Avatar? Okay, so right now, 3D is currently a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. It's got tens of thousands of cinema screens, millions of televisions. There's a global 3D distribution network called YouTube that's got more content than any other single entity in the world. You've got B Sky B, you've got Nat Geo, you've got 3Net. There's a lot of different uh, distribution networks that you can take advantage of immediately. Uh, formally specialized hardware, 3D rigs, 3D cameras, 3D editing software techniques, these have been commoditized and anyone can buy or rent these items at varying costs, of course, but they are readily available. And as we've all been discussing, filmmakers have a choice now that they've never really had before, and that choice is, do they shoot their live action material or do they shoot in 2D and convert? Tony Stark made a lot of money from doing that, so there's a compelling uh, there's a compelling argument for it. Now, the conventional wisdom would say that it's more economical. I'm going to disagree with that publicly. Obviously, if you've got a library title, converting is your only choice, and Jurassic Park and Titanic have done very, very well. But what we've seen most recently is that movies that are intended for 3D release are being shot in 2D and converted. So why is this happening? And they're the biggest movies, where obviously directors can do whatever they choose. But you know, Hollywood and uh, the motion picture industry in general are very mature industries. And they do certain things in certain ways. Directors, producers, cinematographers, they've got a comfort zone. They know when they show up on set with a 35 millimeter motion picture camera or an Arri Alexa or whatever their particular tool of choice is, they know how to make that work. There's no sense of fear. 3D is still a very big unknown for whoever it is that's writing that $200 million check to back up that six billion dollar property. So like Jim said, if they can wait until later in the process to make their decision, to feel well, what's our comfort level with this, where can we go with this, that's mostly what's driving it. It's political factors and economic factors for the studios. It is definitely untrue that it is less expensive to convert a film. If you look at a film like Jurassic Park or uh, Titanic or Avengers, you're talking about eight, ten, twenty million dollar conversion projects that involve hundreds of people in the United States, in India, in China, you know, massive, massive amount of labor, and they're under the pressure of time. To do a day and date release with a 2D feature, it's very, very difficult to do. Plus, if you're involved in independent cinema or anything lower than, say, $5 million, you can just forget about conversion for the most part. You might be able to fix a shot here or there, and I certainly don't object to conversion, but the budget for conversion of any of these major Hollywood studio features greatly exceeds the budget of an independent film, and it's not practical. Now, there are a lot of very powerful guys in Hollywood that think that you should be shooting 3D. 
and there are a lot of reasons why you should do that. I want to talk a little bit about the effects that 3D has on the viewer because of course we're talking about filmmaking. This is not a technology conference, this is a film festival and it's all about the story. I've been involved in 3D for 22 years and people love to tell me when I tell them that I'm involved in 3D, not so much anymore but it used to be the case, oh well, you know it doesn't help the story. And what I counter with now is, yeah, you know, shooting your movie on film doesn't help the story either. Shooting it on an Arri Alexa doesn't help the story. These are all technologies. And if we as filmmakers choose to utilize them effectively, then it will help the story. And uh, cinema, I will also add, is about spectacle. If it was only about story, we'd be reading a book or we'd be listening to a radio play. There is something spectacular about the cinematic experience, and 3D definitely enhances that. This diagram is from a presentation that Barry Sandrew of uh, Legend 3D put together. And according to Barry, there's all these areas of the brain that are stimulated by visual content when you are looking at 3D material. The binocular stereoscopic vision, the process of stereopsis, is a deeply ingrained sense like smell or taste or touch and you are exciting the visual cortex with stereoscopic content in a way that 2D content simply cannot and I would even argue that converted 3D content has a difficult time of doing this as well. It's tricking you into thinking that you're seeing 3D and you've got a trained response. I'm in a 3D movie theater wearing 3D glasses. That kind of looks 3D. It must be. How many people here are familiar with the term the uncanny valley? Okay, not that many. This is a term that comes from robotics and it basically describes that as we move further away from a cute beepy tin can and closer towards a robot that looks like a human, we wind up with a walking corpse that is generally repulsive to people to interact with. And this uncanny valley uh, analogy which was created first for robotics can apply to everything from plastic surgery and I would even say 3D movies. So when we're dealing with a converted film, there are elements of it that are 3D, but there are subtleties that are missing. Just like in a 2D animated film, I can tell I'm not looking at a real person. Why? Because as a human who interacts with other humans and the real world constantly every single day of our lives, we are so subconsciously in tune with the subtleties of nature and everything around us that it is extremely, extremely difficult for conversion to capture all that detail. And it's easy with live action stereoscopic cinematography. It's just done when you hit record. Now, this was an early inspiration for me in 3D. There was a, a Three Stooges film called Spooks. There's a sequence in that video where mad scientist comes out towards the audience with a hypodermic needle. It comes into the audience and everybody in the theater was like, whoa! And it occurred to me at that moment that it's very rare that you are in a cinema, that something happens on the screen that evokes an emotional response from everyone in the room in the way that 3D does. Salvador Dali was fascinated with 3D. He has a hall of stereoscopy in his museum in Figuera, Spain. His fascination stems from the fact that neither the left image nor the right image is the image. It's only the virtual canvas in the viewer's mind that makes up the stereoscopic image. So as stereoscopic filmmakers, we have the ability to really do something to the viewer's perception that you simply cannot do in 2D. I'm not going to talk about beam splitters that much except to say that they are generally bigger than we want them to be. Everybody's working to make them smaller and more manageable. This is an image of our latest uh, beam splitter and it is very easy to manage. It can be used on steady cams, and the goal is to give the filmmakers all of the tools that they are used to having because we don't want to compromise our creativity to shoot in 3D. We want to be able to get the camera into small spaces. We want it to be untethered. We want it to be lightweight. We want it to move around the way a normal camera would move. Do we have sound from this to the soundboard? We do. Okay, so this is going to be the very, the very last thing that I'm going to show. Very, very quick. So one of the most important things for 3D is keeping the camera moving. We don't want to create a sense that the camera is too big and static all the time. By putting it on a steady cam, it opens us up to all the normal types of shots we'd have in a 2D production, and it just really enhances the 3D effect. We get motion parallax, we get a real natural sense of being there. And of course, we always want to use the same kind of camera support systems that we're used to in 2D. Things like steady cam, handheld, lightweight jibs. We don't want to have to sacrifice that to be shooting in 3D. 
So we can see Phil is negotiating these stairs without much difficulty at all. And that's exactly what we want. It's a common misconception that steady camera handheld shots are not possible or too expensive to do in 3D. Not the case. So I apologize for the 2D presentation of that right there, but uh, I think everybody gets the idea. 3D technology is here right now, and everyone in this room can monetize 3D productions that they would be doing. And I hope that everyone will explore it. I'm going to give the microphone back to Jacques. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So we move on to the uh, next speaker. In the